First, thank you for attending and thank you in advance for providing us valuable feedback. There are two goals in our work together. First, to provide you with a quick 30-minute overview of what has been studied and what has been learned over the past year with regard to facilities. Second, our goal is to spend the majority of the time gathering your feedback. We know that the minute facilities are discussed, two things happen in communities. First, a plethora of plans and assumptions happen. People may state emphatically that they know what is being built and where it is being built. Second, people ask questions about the cost. Tonight we'll definitely show you that there is no plan. Rather, we're starting that planning process together. Second, as we move through the presentation, I think you will see that we are well positioned and have been planning financially. Again, thank you for coming, and let's get started. DeForest Area School District has a long history of outstanding community engagement. We see our role as leaders, both the school board and leadership team, as one of listening to the community in order to guide the journey of the district. It's no secret that our community is growing. Standing on the roof of my own home, I've watched 24 new houses be built in the immediate neighborhood in the past year. New houses, in many cases, means new students. In examining our facilities, we know we are very near our maximum capacities. The design of the space is no longer adequate, the facilities are aging, and the population will continue to grow as new subdivisions and infrastructures are created. So, we're coming together to decide how to work through these challenges. In addition to tonight's input session, a community advisory committee is forming. This cross-section of community volunteers will advise the school board on how to address space and operational needs for the next 10 years. The committee is open to all district residents, parents of students in our schools, and our school staff. The committee will meet about twice monthly starting in August, moving through until their work is complete, maybe in January. As we move through the next 30 minutes, knowing that we're trying to hit the highlights of what was studied and learned very quickly, if you have any questions, there are green note cards for each person. Please use these to jot down any questions. Some questions may be answered in another part of the presentation, and you'll simply cross it off your list. Some questions may not be answered, and we can answer them at the end of the presentation. And some questions may require a little more fact gathering, and we can post those as FAQs to the website. Speaking of which, there are excellent pages on the district website dedicated to the work related to facilities over the past two years. There is, of course, much more information there, more than the next 30 minutes allows us to share. Let's start with a quick overview of the seven school sites. First, these are the four primary sites for elementary education. Morrisonville Elementary in the northern part of the district serves about 70 students. Eagle Point Elementary in DeForest on Holm Street serves about 280 students. Yehara Elementary in DeForest serves about 380 students. And Windsor Elementary in the southern part of the district serves about 550 students. Each of these elementary schools serves kindergarten through grade four. In Wisconsin, about 20% of school districts structure themselves as elementary being kindergarten through grade four like us, a middle school of fifth through eighth grade, and a traditional ninth through 12th grade high school. In addition to the elementary schools, there is a middle school located in DeForest that serves about 1,000 students in grades 5 through 8. The building was designed to assist students in the transition from elementary school to middle school and then to a high school structure. It has two specific areas. The west half of the building is designed in pods, replicating more of an elementary feel, while the east side of the building looks more like a traditional high school structure with individual classrooms surrounding a larger library media center. The district operates with one additional building, the Holum Education Center. Holum Center, or HEC as we call it, is a multifunctional building. The lower level has student classrooms where services are provided for our three-year-olds. In Wisconsin, all public school districts are required to provide services for students with special needs between the ages of 3 and 21. 
Additionally, there is a 4K site, or 4-year-old kindergarten, in the lower level of HEC. The majority of our 4-year-old program happens at community service providers around the district and will serve about 260 students this fall. In addition to the 4-year-old and 3-year-old programs, the HEC also houses the district offices, including buildings and grounds, their storage and operations, shipping and receiving, and technology, along with their storage and operations. Finally, the HEC is also used as an overflow practice facility given the gym, so it is definitely a multifunctional building. This timeline represents the date each building opened and any major renovations. Starting with Windsor Elementary opening in 1912, you can trace the history of Windsor Elementary School, all in the golden color. The building opened in 1912 and has had five remodels or additions over 102 years. The last remodel was completed in 1997. Looking at Morrisonville Elementary, the building opened around 96 years ago and has had one remodel. Likewise, you can examine each building. The last time the district tackled a major building and renovation plan was back in 2003 when both the high school and the middle school were remodeled. The last time an elementary project was on the table was in the early 90s, a little over 20 years ago. Those projects have served the district well. At this point in time, we're hoping to create a vision and a plan to address facility needs for the next 10 years. Knowing where we are before we think about the future, we've spent a year of doing our homework and we're going to try and give you about a 20 minute overview before we spend the bulk of the time listening to your thoughts. The overview is organized by a symbol on each slide. When you see the magnifying glass, we're sharing the list of what was studied. When you see the light bulb, we're sharing what we learned. The visual representation on the left of the slide is also a summary. Each of the topics we studied is listed in a colored bubble. Safety, technology, facilities, stakeholder input, finances, etc. Next to each bubble are some simple bullet point highlights of what we studied specific to each of those bubbles. One of the first steps we took in the process of reviewing our facilities was to create a report that would provide us with the most comprehensive view of the condition of our buildings. We hired the Plunkett Research team to walk through our buildings and to interview our staff. As a result of looking at the physical structures, we were able to generate a list of items that range from higher priority things that were either safety, code compliance, or security concerns, to a list of items that would be less urgent but would be recommended should we plan a larger renovation project. Our interest in this study extended beyond the aging condition of the buildings and their components. We were also interested in the facility's ability to continue to meet the educational needs of students. The facility report is available on our website if you'd like to review the full report. Here we're going to highlight a few areas of concern. We know that some of our buildings are aging, and even though they're well maintained, we have structural issues that will need to be addressed over the next few years, such as accessibility. It's also apparent after heavy rains that some of our schools have drainage and water runoff issues. While we do what we can to incorporate more energy efficient practices and purchase energy efficient equipment, there are opportunities to improve in this area. We know that we have recurring issues with traffic safety in the immediate area around school buildings due to the traffic flow and traffic volume related to the start and end of the school day, and also on days when large events are held in our school buildings. Of all the items on this list, the one that matters most to our students and staff is not just the number, but also the type of educational spaces we create. If we close our eyes and imagine a classroom, we likely think of rows of desks occupied by students with a teacher lecturing at the front of the class. That environment is what led to the design of our current learning spaces over 50 years ago. But today it's not unusual to see that classrooms are buzzing with activities where students are interacting and learning in a variety of ways. We also have a need for smaller areas where students can receive individual support for their learning in a quieter, one-on-one -on -one environment. 
As you were able to see in the previous timetable, both the high school and middle school were renovated and remodeled using the proceeds of the last referendum. Our studies show that the size and space is adequate at the high school and middle school for the immediate future, but we also know that a change in programming may cause us to revisit that assumption. We know that we have three elementary buildings that need significant attention and investment over the next few years. And we know that the locations and layouts of driveways, parking, and entrances should be addressed to improve our traffic flow for buses, cars, and students walking and biking to school. As I said earlier, the comprehensive study will serve as a resource for us as we move forward, and it's available on the website for your review. Switching over now to school safety, we conducted a number of walkthroughs at each building and had site reviews by our insurance carrier with the sole purpose of identifying safety issues and concerns. These studies served as guidance for the community-wide safety committee recommendations and meeting the district's goals for addressing safety concerns. We took on a number of projects over the last few years aimed at improving school safety. We started with remodeling entries, and from there we addressed our visitor protocols. We continue to put safety at the forefront of everyone's minds and stepped up communication, drills, and overall increased awareness of safety issues affecting schools. We know that school safety is a high priority for the entire community, and we're proud of the progress we've made in a number of areas, but we realize that school safety issues still remain, and it's evident that there are limitations as to what improvements can be made given the current structural design and school floor plans. We can think of safety in another way, safety of a technological system and the safe use by students of technology. When it comes to technology, we've examined our infrastructure and the hardware and software that we utilize both for learning and systems operation. Payroll software, special education software, all make up part of our system. But most importantly, we've looked at the relationship between modern learning environments and technology, as well as our professional development needs. What have we learned? We needed to continue to invest in the infrastructure to support what is needed now and what is coming. This meant adding significant wireless access points which have enhanced our service. It also meant adding hardware such as the two to one initiative in grades three through six or thinking more about printers. An additional finding was that our technology needs to be versatile given our space limitations and how students use technology on the fly all the time as well as testing. As we think about our aging facilities, we have to think about what those sites need now and what they could potentially need in the future. One part of that determination is answering the question, what will our population look like? Determining the school population works hand in hand with community growth. So this past year, we continued our connection with each of the nine municipalities to continue to monitor their growth and their plans. In general, Windsor is experiencing a resurgence of building, development of its infrastructure, and population growth. Additionally, we've studied our own student enrollment, incoming, our youngest learners, and our outgoing graduating classes. Our class sizes right now range from 222 to 278. Each of these classes will age through the system. In general, we can advance the student population through the system and see what our total population will be in years to come. Right now, we are at about 3,500 students and steadily growing. As an example, we've worked recently with the Town of Windsor regarding Bear Tree Subdivision, which recently received approval from the Town Zoning and Planning Commission. This subdivision will add about 344 single-family homes, senior living, parks, and walking paths to our community. This kind of information, as well as information from other municipalities, helps us understand that we will easily maintain our current student population with a steady increase. The two pictures are from just south of Windsor Elementary. 
The picture on the right is a street of homes built in the last year. That's the south side of the street. The north side of the street is much the same. The picture on the left is the earth moving happening for the next phase of a subdivision also south of Windsor Elementary. The price and size of these homes tells us that the homes will be occupied by young, growing families and add population to the southern part of the district. Every year, the district gathers information regarding enrollment and population trends, and we use this data to inform our decisions related to space needs. One indicator of enrollment growth is referred to as the kindergarten trends. What you see here is a graph of the actual enrollment from 2003 to present in red. From this data, we look at two trend lines, the one in red, which is the long-term trend, and the one in blue, which only takes into account the past five years. As you can see, our five-year trend is showing that our kindergarten numbers indicate growth at the elementary level, which is expected to filter through our K-12 enrollment in coming years. This graph represents the various class sizes. It is challenging to know the impact of the class sizes. In reality, we can seat every student in a classroom desk. However, that is truly not the educational method that we use. Our spaces involve small group work, partner work, movement, whole class instructional, individual work, and many special services providers. We currently teach in the hallways as well as in the classrooms because of these numbers and the designs of 25, 30, or 50 years ago not providing spaces that match the type of instruction that happens. Imagine being a student receiving reading instruction as a class passes you by to go to music. Then a student passes you by to go to the bathroom, and another student to return a library book, and the principal is moving towards recess duty. Small classroom sizes, lack of storage, narrow hallways, inadequate office spaces, inadequate cafeteria spaces, and small gyms all become a part of the challenges as we put those ideas against these class sizes. With the knowledge that we will have steady growth, we compare this to the capacity of the schools. Target class size capacity is the point where the building is functioning optimally as an educational facility. Before reaching the identified maximum class size capacity, the district should be planning and preparing for the future of the facility or other facilities within the district. The maximum class size capacity is the point where a building is at the maximum student count to run effectively and efficiently. At our elementary and middle schools, we are between target and maximum. This tells us that now is the time to be planning. This target capacity is about how many students per building. There's another measure we look at with regard to how many students fit in a space. In the right side example, looking just at the far right column, you can read the header drastically undersized repeatedly. This indicates that the current size of classrooms, even if there were enough of them, is too small. Another example on the left related to our report for DeForest Area High School. In this example, the students fit in the classrooms but other considerations such as storage, pool size, or lab space are mentioned. So the question becomes, what are the community's priorities? And that's why you're here. This is a piece of the work we do with TIES. We contract with TIES to utilize their mapping software in order to see the location of homes. In this example, we can see the location of the kindergarten through grade 4 homes. What could you notice? Well, we may notice that the homes are clustered around Yahara and Eagle Point Elementary Schools. We may notice that in the southern part of the district, the homes are more dispersed. So our next natural step may be to examine building starts and look closer at our municipalities. In working with our municipalities, we look at permits and construction but also the development of infrastructure, changes to property value, and their census data. As an example, if their census data shows us that the population is predominantly 45 to 85 years old, we can make some assumptions and do some mathematical calculations around receiving less elementary age children per household. 
as typically people between 45 and 85 years old may not be having their first children. If, however, the population is between 18 and 45 years old, we may make a different set of assumptions, one that includes more young children coming into our schools. This same thinking holds true based on the value of a home. An expensive home may have less young children, whereas a starter home may have more young children. So in working with our municipalities, we can get a broader picture of the potential growth of our district, as well as the impact of these changes on property values to our district finances. What else are we learning working with our municipalities? Well, we already shared that the increasingly active building of single-family homes, senior living, apartments, parks, and paths is happening. This will, in turn, bring more students into our district. In addition, we'll see the completion of Highway 51, modifications to Highway 19 at the on-ramp to the interstate, and we are seeing property values increase after a multi-year decline. We know that frequently the first question asked when school districts start talking about facilities isn't why or when, but instead it's how much. Well, the district has been preparing for that question for a long time. We've taken every opportunity to refinance debt in order to reduce debt payments and make room for any new debt that may be necessary to address our facility needs. We're positioned in a place in the state aid formula where debt will minimally impact our state aid. We have an adequate reserve, some of which can be used to mitigate the impact of any new debt should that be necessary. And last and very important is the current bond market interest rates, which are extremely favorable, will allow our district to put more funds towards principal payments and less to interest costs. The DeForest Area School District is financially strong. We are one of 17 districts in Wisconsin with a AA plus credit rating. From the standpoint of debt, we're in an excellent financial position to address facility needs and the learning needs of students. We're very aware that community members will want the question, how much, answered right away as options come up for consideration. Our Board of Education has a history of engaging stakeholders in discussions that help shape the future of education in the DeForest Area School District. We seek and value input throughout the school year about what's important to the community for educational programming as well as facilities. The input sessions in July and August are one example. We will be seeking more input in October and November as the School Board and Community Advisory Committee develops facility plans. In February 2014, we brought together over 120 community members who gave input on the vision of our schools. We also meet monthly with a parent key communicator group. Throughout the year, we also work closely with many organizations, parent-teacher organizations, staff, and students to get feedback and input on a variety of topics. Given where we are today and what we anticipate in the future, stakeholders at the Framework for Our Future 2.5 event identified five priorities for the district to consider as we continually improve our services for students, families, and the community. Two of these relate to facilities. Other priorities included safety and stakeholder engagement, among a few others. One of the goals of the district is to ensure consistent, up-to-date facilities and programming throughout the district. Some of the identified priorities lend themselves better to more modern school designs, rather than the traditional classrooms with rows of desks and the teacher at the front. And we do want to ensure, especially at the elementary school level, consistent educational opportunities for all students. This means that children have access to the same educational opportunities whether they attend Eagle Point Elementary School, Morrisonville, Windsor, or Yahara. At this point, we would like your input. Please close this presentation and use the link labeled Input to answer two questions. One, 
What reactions do you have about the information presented on district facilities and planning? And two, what is important to you for the school board and community advisory committee to consider as they move forward with district facility planning? Again, thank you for taking part in this online presentation. At this time, you'll move forward to giving your input through the online forms. Thank you for being a valuable part of planning together for our future.